first and foremost, I want to say all praises be unto the Most High Almighty, Ahaya Yeshahaya Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Once again, this is the Estin Community Church of Christ. I am Archbishop Shamar. I'm Bishop Tabak. And we be bringing you today's Sabbath report slash lesson. All right. <clears throat> and it's kind of a big topic, but we're going to try to condense it as much as possible. All right. And then this is reports going to be on the sovereignty of God. All right. So we're going to get into the sovereignty of God and just what all that entails when we say that. All right, because some people know that God is, you know, supreme, and but I don't think the inner understanding on to how God is sovereign and His sovereignty operates is properly understood. All right, so once again, before we get into the report, we're going to go to Isaiah 53, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. Who has believed our report, <clears throat> and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? All right, so who has believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? All right, we always start off with the scripture, because once again, even in Isaiah's time, this was always the question, who is going to believe the report, based on how the Most High operates, all right? In the Old Testament, all right, God the Father, all right, sends the Son, all right, the Word of God onto a chosen vessel. And the Word of God reveals onto that chosen vessel, all right, what God the Father revealed onto him. All right, that chosen vessel is then sent out to the people to declare, thus saith the Most High. And it's on the people now to have understanding, to have their ears and their hearts circumcised, and to come to an understanding to Inter to, to, to understand that what the prophets were saying in the report that they were bringing back was true. All right, because the Most High didn't deal directly in the open with individuals and put his arm around them and say, I'm endorsing this individual, but dealt with them in a secret way, all right, in the way he reveals himself and the way he sends about the word, this led on to many false prophets, all right, coming and saying, you know, the Most High spoke to them. All right, and this usually happens in the night. So they'll come and say they dreamed and the Most High spoke to them and this is what happened. And it's always on the people to discern with their ears and their hearts and to come to an understanding. All right, so with that being said, we're to go through the text and ensure that they're translated, interpreted, and taught correctly. Now, once again, the, the report at hand is on the sovereignty of God. All right, and the reason why even going to this topic is because getting to know God the Father the more, all right? Getting to know the Most High in His fullness. You can't know the Most High without understanding how He's sovereign, all right? And I think this is the reason why even right now a lot of this is going out where people are coming onto the understanding of sovereign and such and such because the Most High is beginning to reveal how he operates, all right, and how he does things. All right, so we're going to go to Psalms 115 and 2. Psalms chapter 115, verse 2. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now, where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He has done whatsoever he has pleased. All right. So when the heathen should say, where is now their God? All right. And people say this because God doesn't come for a long time. He might not speak to anybody. All right. Even in the Old Testament, there are sometimes he wouldn't speak to anybody. All right. But even when Samuel died, you know, um, Saul wanted to, it was Saul. Yeah, Saul wanted to speak you know, or get revelation. And he had to go to, you know, a witch to go to someone to summon up him to, to get some type of revelation, because the Most High is not dealing with anybody. If he has, doesn't have a chosen vessel he's speaking through, he's not speaking to anybody. All right. But when they ask, where is now their God? We know that God is in the heavens. He does whatsoever he has pleased. All right. And this is the understanding we're to kind of elaborate on and amplify that God does whatsoever he pleases. And I think 
it's hard for a lot of people to grasp that when certain things is transpiring in the world with them, with their family, with their friends, in their lives. Especially when it's bad things. When it's good things, everyone's okay with God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. When bad things happen, all right, traumatic things happen, this is when the understanding kind of is like, why is this happening? All right. So we're going to get into the sovereignty of God. All right. What is the sovereignty of God or what is the doctrine of the sovereignty of God? What is the sovereignty of God? Sovereignty of God is the Christian teaching that God is the supreme authority and all things are under his control. God is the sovereign Lord of all by an incontestable right as the creator, owner, and possessor of heaven and earth. Sovereignty is an attribute of God based upon the premise that God as the creator of heaven and earth, has absolute right and full authority to do or allow whatever he desires. All right. So the sovereignty of God, all right, once again, is a Christian teaching. All right. So this is a Christian key principle, all right, that people have to understand, all right, is that God is the supreme authority. All right. Everybody believes and understands that, all right. But it comes to the next thing, that all things are under his control. Or a lot of the times, um, people think that whatever is happening is out of God's control. All right, whether it be in people's lives, whether it be outside that's happening, everything is under God's control. All right, this is the Christian understanding that there's supreme authority. All things, anything that happened, your pen that just fell, that was sanctified by God. It's all under His control. There's not one thing that's happening without God controlling that direct thing. All right. And the other thing we have to understand is that sometimes we want to understand, OK, if there's something connected to what God is doing sometime. All right. And this is what it's trying to show you. Some things that God does is just because he's doing whatever he wants, just like how you would do whatever you want. All right. So we can't always look for, oh, why is this? Why is that? Not everything is for that. All right. Some things he's doing or whatever he's allowing and doing whatever he desires the same way sometimes we do all right so this is the premise all right that the sovereignty is an attribute of god all right based that god as the creator all right of heaven and earth all right has full right and authority to do and allow whatever he wants all right and we're going to touch on that right being as a creator. All right, but continue for us. The Protestant position is described in the Westminster Confession of Faith, which states, quote, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordained ordain whatever comes to pass, end quote. The Catholic position is similar, quote, And so we see the Holy Spirit, the principal author of sacred scripture, often attributing actions to God without mentioning any secondary causes. All right. So here we see, all right, key principles all right and this is from the westminster confession of faith and this is from the protestants where they release their confession of faith all right and in there we're going to be going into more of that document as we go on but in there it states that god from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass all right. And going back to our monarchy lesson, we understood that dealing with Israel, he dealt with them hands on. But the way the nations dealt with him, the way he dealt with the nations, he was dealing them through the mandate of heaven. So their understanding was that if this you put someone in place there and tomorrow everything is OK, that means God is OK with it. Because if God wasn't OK with it, guess what would happen? It wouldn't be happening. 
all right? And when God's not okay with something, right away, things shift, all right? That's how they were connecting with God. So this is how the nations was dealing with God when we we're going into the monarchy lesson. They understood that God controls everything. So they're watching the weather, they're watching everything. When they place someone in leadership to know his approval, they would watch because that person's not gonna stay in there if God doesn't approve of it. Something's gonna come to pass somewhere, somehow, something to stop that from happening. All right, and because of that, this is how certain claims even happen, even with the Catholic Church, all right, because it shows you the Catholic Church, all right, and so, all right, before we go, the Catholic Church, or, yeah, the Catholic Church, when they reach, release the papal bull, they make a declaration, but anyone could make a declaration. What makes it strong and how you know it's coming from God is, once again, when it comes to the scripture, it comes to pass. That's how you know it's coming from God. So when they write something, and... You could write it right now, all right? Somebody could say they could stop it, but if God agrees with it, it's gonna come to pass. And because it comes to pass, this is their understanding that God okay, is okayed it. All right, so anything that comes to pass, God has okayed it. If it doesn't, if God is not okay with it, it won't come to pass. Nothing that doesn't come to pass is of God. That's what, comes, that's what a false prophet is, because they're gonna tell you something, and guess what happened? It, it doesn't come to pass, all right? That means it's not, it's not going to happen. God's not okay with that. God doesn't agree with that. So whatever they're saying is untrue because God is not putting that in this realm. It's not coming to pass. That's what makes them a false prophet. All right. The Catholic position, all right, kind of similar. It says, and so we see the Holy Spirit, the principal author of sacred scripture, often attributing actions to God without secondary causes. So, a lot of time, back to what I was saying, we look for a secondary cause of why God is doing something. Once again, God is sovereign. Some things he does is because he just wanted to do it. Just the same way you have your shoe, you want to throw it over there, you want to leave it over there, you want to do whatever you want with it, it can end up all over the place. It's yours. Whatever, sometimes you're not even thinking, you just did something real quick. All right? Not to say he has to do that, because God can put a plan to everything, but he has to show you what it means that he's sovereign. The same way we have that ability to do and handle something any way we want, all right? That's the same way God can, and he has to show that in this realm. So some of the things, this is what we're understanding, God is doing without any secondary causes, it's just he's doing it because. All right, so some people ask, why that person got that? They just got that because, all right? That's what God made, wanted to happen. All right, we're gonna continue elaborating on this position as we go further all right but continue this is not a quote primitive mode of speech end quote but a profound way of recalling god's prime primacy and absolute lordship over history and the world end all quote all right so this is the profound way of recalling God's primacy and absolute lordship over history and the world. And I think people don't know how crucial this is to understand because this is how, especially from my understanding, it came to understanding what really transpired in the world and what's really going on because our mind was separate thinking, oh, something's happened, God's not okay with it, we're in a battle, we're in a fight, and it just had to bring to recollection of what happened in the past, what happened with Christ, what happened with the Jews. Anything that transpired in history, God was okay with it. God is in control. God is not losing. All right. And especially now when you see God has his people, you know that God had his hand in all of history. All right. And, and it took this contemplation to bring yourself back to the fullness of the reality of the world and begin to see how God operates really because we're separating God from a lot of things that happen. All right. So when you go and tell somebody about history, they, they say, yeah, God's in control. But when you ask them further and ask them to elaborate or go into a conversation, they don't believe God is agreeing with a lot of these things or things. Man, people are doing things without him having to say so. All right. And, and that's not the case. All right. So anything that happened in history, God has absolute lordship over that. All right. He has caused that to happen. 
All right. Some things for the greater good of his plan, some things have no secondary causes. All right. It has always a first, uh, a, a primary cause, and that's always to bring about the kingdom for his son. All right. Anything else after that is he's not sometimes he's not thinking that deep because it's just connected with the primacy of, of Christ. All right, but continue. Easton's Bible Dictionary defines God's sovereignty as his, quote, absolute right to do all things according to his own good pleasure, end quote. All right. And this is what, and this is hard for even some people because people who are even sick has to come to this realization, all right, because they have to realize, sometimes they're like, why is God doing, it's like, you have to come to a realize that this is happening to me because God wants it to happen to me. All right. He has absolute right. Sometimes we have no right to even question that zero right to question anything, but just to take it right on the shoulder, take anything that's coming and not to question why it's happening or why he's doing this to you. All right. Continue. Nav's topical Bible lists well over 100 verses in the Christian Bible under the entry, quote, sovereign, end quote. All right. We're going to go to First Chronicles 29 and 11. First Chron Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. All right. All right. The Lord is the greatness, the power, the glory, the majesty, the victory. All that is in heaven and in earth is his. All right. He's exalted and he is head above all. And I'm going to kind of make a separation for this lesson just so people kind of grasp what's being said, because we're speaking directly when we're speaking about the sovereignty of God. All right. We got to speak about God, the father. All right. Because Christ is made in his image. All right. And Christ answers to God, the father. All right. So there is one true sovereign when we're speaking of sovereignty and we have to highlight that that is God, the father, who is the head. All right. So this is who we're speaking about. All right. God, the father. All right. Is the one who's plotted all of this for his son. Okay. So he's the one with the true absolute sovereignty. All right. Christ has sovereignty, but his sovereignty is not higher than the father's. All right. Because the father put him in place to do all of that. He designed all of this for him, all right? And he's doing whatever the father is telling him to do, all right? Well, yeah, when you have on the earth, you know what I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. He wants to take the cup from Yeah. He always lets us know that when he says, I, I do my father's will, I'm here to do my father's will. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're speaking about God the Father and his cutthroatness when it comes to his plan and his sovereignty and how we operate, all right? God the Father is who you're seeing all through the Old Testament. A lot of people can't think the Old Testament is wicked and this and that, and the, you know, even the doctrine came out with the, what are they calling it? I forgot their name, the Gnostics and stuff, because some people, if you don't have the law of nature, you can't wrap your head around what really happened in the Old Testament. God the Father is a God of justice, all right? Only way for justice to happen is no nonsense. That means when something happens, you do something, Full punishment comes with no leniency because that's what judgment is, right? Judgment. All right. So in the Old Testament, we've seen a lot of him going about and executing that harsh judgment because he has to show you what it's like for that. And this is how he operates. All right. In the New Testament kind of gets leniency up because you see he sends his son and people are now coming into his son and his son is the one that's given this benefits and this leniency and this mercy on to his followers. All right. But God the Father is very cutthroat. He's head over all. All right. Were we, were we finished here? Yeah, we're at verse 12? Yeah. Okay. Continue for us. Uh, verse 12. 
out of uh, First Chronicles chapter 29. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. All right, so God the Father reigneth over all. We're going to go into the definition of reigneth. Reigneth definition out of the Strong's Concordance. Uh, Hebrew number H4910. Uh, Hebrew word mashal, a primitive root to rule, to have, to make, have. Make to have, um, dominion, govern, or governor, indeed, reign, bear, bear um, cause to, have, rule, ruling, ruler, have power. All right, to have power. All right. So what does God's sovereignty consist of? All right. It must consist of supremacy, kingship, all right, and Godhead. All right. God, once again, can only be God if he's sovereign. And he has to show us that he's sovereign in the way he operates. And this is why it's very cutthroat when you're dealing outside of Christ and dealing with God the Father. All right. He does as he pleases. All right. We're going to go to Daniel 4, 34. Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. And at the end, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All right. And Nebuchadnezzar is writing this because, once again, the Most High had to teach kings that he was in control, and Nebuchadnezzar was getting up out of his own way. All right. And the Most High made it that way. He made it that way so it could be written in the, in the scriptures. All right. So he made Nebuchadnezzar that way. All right, Nebuchadnezzar is realizing how the Most High operates, and he's writing a record of how the Most High operates because he was being returned from how he was. All right, continue. Verse 35 And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. All right, and this is kind of hard for people to understand. Before anybody enters into Christ, to God, you are nothing. To God the Father, you are nothing. Nothing. And then you have to come to this realization, all right, on why you are nothing to God without coming into his son, all right? You are nothing to him, all right? And this is what Nebuchadnezzar is writing a report of, all right? All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing to God, all right? Read, read that, um, verse 35 again. Uh, this is Daniel chapter 4, verse 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? All right, so once again, and you're going to see that this is even reaching out to how the world operates, as we're seeing, that all these people are nothing. They're separated from God. There's, this is God who has set up this integral system outside that has made these people nothing. All right. A lot of people are like, some fight against me. Someone's putting me on the thing. They're taking this. You're not dealing with God because you don't deal with God from a long time people have been nothing. We went through the monarchy lesson. The only person God was dealing with was the kings. He allowed the king to rule. Everybody else was placed under him. The only way the king could rule is if there's a system in place that has the king have authority over you. So these laws hasn't changed. This stuff hasn't changed. 
It's the same thing. People has always been under this type of bondage. Unless they're coming towards his kingdom, coming towards the kings. Because that's when you're coming towards God. They're in the representation of God. So people who start to come in their kingdom, work for them, be with them, they started to have that relaxation. Anybody outside of that is reputed as nothing. Peasants. And this is how the world operated. And it's still operating like this, all right? Over here in these lands, remember, we have to remember, these are Christian lands. So just like how in Israel, he took Israel and he started to make all of them free. He started to change that dominion, to have a king, but have the people under them be free as well with the king. And not to put their own people under bondage. But other, any other place, people have always been under bondage to the person that, that's the leader. And the only way people will do that in this world, it has to make sense, is that it's hidden from you. That's what comes when you go look at any peasant, you go look at the word peasant, it's an uneducated person. God makes these people uneducated because education is what's keeping them in this bondage, okay? The laws, the this, everything. They can't see how they're under this rulership. All right? So once again, the Most High does according to his will in the army of heaven amongst the inhabitants of earth. Nobody can say to God the Father, why are you doing this? All right. And we're going to see that even that to be questioned, even to have that in your heart, God is testing that. All right. We're going to go to Psalms 22 and 28. Psalms chapter 22, verse 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among the nations all right so the kingdom is the Lord's all right and he is the governor among the nations all right and I think people don't really understand that the nations right now the way they're set up the way they operate they know that everything that's happening transpiring is based on the governing of God all right they know these things and they know this based on their integral you know history and dealing with the most high this has not changed they have all the records they have everything from history on down to know about the god the father and how we operate and how they set up this system and how everything operates all right this is why he's acknowledged in their nations all right, in their constitutions, in their preambles. All right, and once again, the same word as Rainus, going back to the Hebrew word, mashal. All right, for governor. All right, it's the same Hebrew word. All right, we're going to go to 1 Timothy 6 and 15. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. Which in his times he shall show... Who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only ha hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen, nor can see, to whom be, be honored and power everlasting, so be it. All right which in his time he shall show who is the blessed and only Pontate, the king of kings, the lord of lords. All right. Now there's somebody else right now who's calling himself the king of kings, the lord of lords, and the only Pontate. All right. And that's the pope. All right. That title, he actually even uses that same word. All right. We're going to go into the definition of a Pontate. Pontitate, definition, um, ruler, <coughs> sovereign, broadly, one who wields great power or sway. Noun, a person who possesses great power as a sovereign, monarch, or ruler. A ruler who has a lot of power, especially one whose power is not limited, for example, by the existence of of a parliament. All right. So a pontitate is a ruler, a sovereign. All right. Broadly, one who wields great power or sway. 
all right? But the pontitate means like supreme power. So they're sovereigns. But pontitate means that this person is running the whole shit. And this is what's happening with the Pope. So right now he's coming in that likeness, that he runs that. And this is why we have this in First Timothy, that God's going to show who's the blessed and only pontinate. All right. Which is Christ, who's in representation of the Father. All right. So right now, the Pope, out of all the people in the world, you have to understand that he's taking on this image right now as being the controller of the earth where no one, nobody can say anything to him. Okay. He can say things to other people, but nobody can say anything to him when they were dealing with laws and things inscribed in law. All right. All right, we're going to go to the sovereignty of God articulated throughout the ancient church history. All right, we're going to go to the eras of today. So we're going to go to how people think when they're thinking about the, how things operate in the world or is being governed in the world. All right. And this is the modern thought that's taking place and going around. The sovereignty of God articulated throughout ancient church history. Um, 30 AD to... 330 AD by Dr. Keith A. Sherlin, um, subtitled The Errors of Today. The doctrine of God's absolute sovereignty is under severe attack in our generation. Neothesis, bracket, denied his om omniscience and omnipotence, close bracket. Arminians, bracket, denied his omnipotent power over the will of man close bracket and humanism man is the center and hope of the world is wrecking many people in the faith and it is per permeating many churches whereby man is exalted the humanist mind worships reason and by reason they seek to dethrone God from his place of absolute rule over the earth. All right. And this is this is what we're beginning to understand. And even at, to come to God's thought, it had to come out of reason because a, a lot of things God deal with is not dealing with reason. All right. So reason is very cutthroat and concrete. All right. Where God is not everything that God does not, not deal with reason. All right. And there's a this is why God has to create animal that look like this, make this happen, that. He has to show you that reason is not equated with God, all right? When someone is under control and they can do whatever they want, some things is not attached to reason because he's sovereign, all right? So sovereign and reason is two, you know, separate things. If I'm sovereign, there not have to be a reason I do everything. I can do anything I want. So this is why you can see some things can connect to reason, but for God, a lot of things can't connect to reason because he has to show that he's sovereign. All right. So, you know, just like, oh, you pick up your shoe and you got in your place, you placed your thing over there. There's no re real reason you placed it. You just did that over there. All right. There's no connection, deep thought behind it. Nothing. You did it because you wanted to do it. <laughs> OK, so this is what we have to think of with God sometimes, because everything we could be like, oh, what's this happening? That's happening. If it's something from God, you'll assure that God will point it out to you numerous times all right um, continue for us even the church has caved into the pressures of humanistic rationalism people balk at the sovereignty of god and instead seek to place man in control of history salvation and ordinary events of life these religious humanists reject the absolute sovereignty of God by attempting to foolishly attack God and say that if God is absolutely sovereign, then he is responsible for sin. Others redefine God's will and say that God has chosen to limit himself in light of man's power and freedom of will. All right. So people balk at the sovereignty of God. They instead placing man in history, 
or man in control of history, salvation, ordinary events in life. All right, so even ordinary events in life. And this is more to the people who God deals with. When God's dealing with you and you're his child, everything that's happened in your life is for a reason. All right, so you can't be compared to everybody else. And this is when you have to watch every single thing that's happened in your life because God, is being your father, has to teach you. So every single thing that's transpiring to you is some lesson that God is trying to teach you. All right, because once again, if he's dealing with you as a son, he's correcting you. All right, so the only way to correct you is through the events happening in life. Everybody else, he's not correcting them. So whatever's happened to them is just happening to them. All right, unless it's bringing them towards Christ. If it's bringing them towards Christ, then that's a reason. Other than that, everybody outside who's outside of Christ, things are just happening with them. All right, because they're just part of the story, but they're nothing to God. All right, and this even reaches out to their regular everyday life and how God has them living, how he has us operating in this earth. All right, and this is because the only people that deserves any type of benefit in this world is true believers of Christ. So we're going to go to Romans 9 and 15. Romans chapter 9 verse 15. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. All right, so this is what I'm trying to show you. Everybody is damned. And this is how God has, has to have it be so that he can have mercy on who you want to have mercy on. So from coming out of Adam, everybody is damned and in a damned condition. And it has to be like that. And then God goes and be like, okay, who am I going to get out the damned, um, damned position and give my mercy on? And these are the people he bestows it on. All right, continue. Verse 16, so then it is, not, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. All right. So once again, if God is bringing you towards him, bringing you to him, this is nothing of you. It's not of you that willeth anything, nor him that runneth, but God that looked on you in the place where everyone's damned and showed mercy to you. That's why you're here. You're listening to this. You're understanding this. You're coming towards Christ. God had pity on your wretched soul and showed mercy. All right, continue. Verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up that I may show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. All right, so here he's showing to Pharaoh. So Pharaoh has zero control over the mechanism of his makeup. God is saying, I made you. I made you the villain for this thing right here so I could smack you, all right? And everyone can witness this. What can Pharaoh say? What can you do? You know what I'm saying? This is God showing he does what he wants. Imagine you being Pharaoh and God telling you this. Would you be able to deal with that? All right, continue. Verse 18. Therefore, has he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he harden it. All right, so he has mercy on who he has mercy on. That's who he shows the light of Christ. And anybody else, he hardened it. That's what comes nobody want to learn about truth. No one want to learn about what's going on with the identification, their ID, you know, how the world operates, how you can really do things like this. He has made these people live in this world, all right? We have to understand that if God showed mercy onto you, you are special. You are special because this is not bestowed on onto many many people this is something that you need to cherish with any with all your heart because you could have been somebody that's outside that you have zero control over what you're doing and where you're going all right so we're gonna go to definition of mercy definition of mercy 
out of the Strong's Concordance. Um, Strong's number G1653, Greek word eleo, um, from G1656 to compassionate by word or deed, specifically by divine grace. Have compassion, pity on, have obtained, have received, have show, have shown mercy on. All right, so it's divine grace. This is what mercy is. Compassionate divine grace and pity. And the only way that can happen is from you being born through Adam and being a wretched sinner from the get-go. Undeserving of anything from God. And from that, God looks at you and bestows his mercy upon you. All right, we're going to go to compassion. Uh, compassion out of the Strong's Concordance. Um, Strong's number G3627. Um, Greek word, oik, oik tiro. Um, also in certain tenses, oik tirio, oik ter ero, um, from oiktos, pity, to exercise pity, have compassion on. Right. To exercise pity, to have compassion on. All right, God has compassion and mercy on whoever he wants, all right? And it's not based on any, you did something and that's why I had, is he just looked that way and same way you're outside and how much people you've seen to ask you for change and you never gave them your mercy. You choose who you want, you're like, you know what, that person, there's no real reason sometimes. Sometimes there's a reason, sometimes it's like, yo, here, here it is right there. Enough times you don't pick any of them. How much of them left out there that you never helped, never chose to bestow that? It's the same way God is seeing people outside. He's seeing them like bums outside. Please, some, you know, give me some righteousness. And he's passing by them like. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it's like. All right. And he bestows mercy. You want like, all right, you know, what? it's a little righteousness for that sinner over there today. That sinner, he's not a sinner today. He got his little change today. All right. The same way we make that decision, the same way he's making his decision on who he's choosing. I'm just thinking about that there when you like give people change and yeah. this, the thought of what change means and the yeah. nothing for mm -hmm. them to change. Mm -hmm. In that sense. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Spiritual sense, because God's giving them change and that change, he's showing mercy, he's showing you change because you're going to change. <laughs> right? And we know who's asking for change. What do they look like? They look wretched. So that's a good law of nature analogy. So that's why he would have that. All right. People outside asking for change are wretched. They look wretched. All right. So people who are under this wretchedness is looking for change from God. And that's the mercy that he's going to bestow on them. So that was a great analogy. All right. We're going to go into the sovereignty of God. All right. By author. W. Pink. I have the book actually here as well. So if those want to go outside, this can answer uh, a lot of people's question when it comes to, you know, daily happenings in their life, how God operates. All right. Because you need to understand how he operates over the affairs, especially in people's lives. Because people could question, ask a lot of things. And this is more specifically on people that's having traumatic things happen to them. And, and it's like, I can't even explain that much because things happen to me, but nothing has been that traumatic to where I have to be like, oh God, this, that. There's people that's lost fingers, arms, this, that, have their face burnt. Look, these are the people we're speaking about directly. People who are the people of God, you be happy because God had mercy on you and you didn't end up like the people out there, paraplegic, handicapped, any different type of way. Arm burnt off, hand cut off, arm done them, car accident. There's many ways, many things that could happen to you. All right. It didn't happen just because God showed mercy on you. And that's why we try to constantly thank God, especially us who are in his body. All right. So we're going to go to Sovereignty of God by Arthur W. Pink. Um, sorry, I didn't put the chapter in this one, but this is chapter one, God's Sovereignty Divine. 
um, Sovereignty of God, uh, chapter one by Arthur W. Pink. Quote, the sovereignty of the God of scripture is absolute, irresistible, infinite. When we say that God is sovereign, we affirm his right to govern the universe, which he has made for his own glory, just as he pleases. We affirm that his right is the right of the potter over the clay. Example, that he may mold that clay into whatsoever form he chooses, fashioning out of the same lump one vessel unto honor another and another unto dishonor. We affirm that he is under no rule or law outside of his own will and nature, that God is a law unto himself, and that he is under no obligation to give an account of his matters to any. All right. So the sovereignty of God of Scripture, once again, is absolute. All right. We, when we say that God is sovereign, once again, somebody is saying that they are affirming, all right, which means confirming in their heart, in their mind, in their whole being, in their whole body, all right. You have to come to this contemplation, all right, that God has the right to govern the universe and has made it for his own glory as he pleases not for any specific way for you or for anything but how he wants all right we affirm his right as the right over the potter over the clay all right that he may mold that clay into whatsoever form he chooses all right meaning you have to come to the realization that god and most people who are coming towards God, most people who's chosen, who showed that mercy on, he's bestowed that understanding in. The people outside of them don't have this understanding, all right? So for them to have this, for them to come to this, he makes these things happen to them because they don't believe God has full control, all right? So a lot of people out there, God is making this happen to, things happen to them, arm loss, this, because in deep down in their heart, they don't believe that God has power, control over all these things. So he leaves them there to think, to ponder, to wonder, to this, to, to come to all of that. Ro Romans um, 9 and 18. Romans 9 and 18. Is that right? exactly. Romans chapter 9, verse 18. Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he harden it. Continue to 19. Um, verse 19, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why does he yet find fault? For who has resisted his will? Continue, yeah. But, nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? All right, so this is what is going back, that when people speak like this in their heart to God, God is angry. He's furious. All right? So one thing for me, anything that happened to me, I'm like, yo, right away, I'm like, God did it right away. Everything, God did it. The things in front of me, outside, someone cut me off, God did it. Everything, I'm, it's God that make it happen, that made it came to pass. I'm okay with it now. You can be okay with certain things now. Everything's happening for a reason, or not a reason per se, but because he wanted to happen. Yes. All right, because when we say reason, it means that we're going to now get to a specific thing. Sometimes it's not specific. When I say that by default, I'm mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So continue for us. Sovereignty. Sovereignty characterizes the whole being of God. He is sovereign in all his attributes. 
He is sovereign in the exercise of His power. His power is exercised as His wills. When He wills, where He wills. All right, so this is why He would make so much things happen in the earth. And if people are like, oh, God should be stopping this. God, God doesn't work for you. <laughs> this is what people are not understanding this is why things is happening in the world because they're like oh it's like you're looking for a superhero to come and save the day every he's like there's no when i'm ready to put my hand in something happening then i will first of all everything that's happening to you is deserving to happen to you the way he designed it Okay, everything that's happened, you are deserving of. Anything that government is doing, someone doing outside, the people are deserving of. All right, based on what's happening, based on what they've done, based on, first of all, coming out of Adam. That's why you deserve it. That's the first and reason why you deserve anything that happened to you. Before you stepped foot and did anything, you deserved it because you're coming from Adam. All right, so once again, he wills, his exercise of his power, his, his power is exercised as he wills, when he wills, where he wills. So this is why when God wills something and he does something, it's like, like it's major. And this is why, even going back to Revelation, when, he, when he's going to strike down Babylon, they're like, oh, God didn't forget, because it's been a while since God willed something. He put his hand directly in something where you're like, yo, this major event that happened, everybody know this is God. This is God's vengeance. Okay, it's been a long time. So this is what comes in, in Revelation 18. This is what they're speaking of. That, oh, he remembered. He remembered the judgment for this woman. Look how long she's been running around doing this stuff. You're thinking God's hands not in nothing. The way he used to judge nations, this nation or this church, you know, the Catholics, they've been doing a lot of things for a lot of time. Old Testament, God, fire coming out, yeah. brimstone, lions come out of their rip up. <laughs> okay, just... yeah. He's kept quiet for quite some time, which is why it's going to be, you're going to know when God is willing something again. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Continue. This fact is evidenced on every page of scripture. For a long season, that power appears to be dormant. And then it is put forth in irresistible might all right so he keeps it because the thing is too if he shows it all the time people will be like oh that's normal it's normal so you're gonna know when this is god because it's been dormant so long once again he hasn't done it so imagine these people israel is in egypt everything's chilling in one day you just see that things start changing plagues start coming frogs start hopping and then a whole nation is being born and something happens and this and that all right. And this is what they tried to mimic in the world. The last time they tried to say that this happened was when this was happening in Israel and Israel got their land back because they're like, oh, God's hands in this. Yeah. He's doing this. He willed it back. With magic. You hear what I'm saying? And he took them out of all nations and he returned them over there. And they won the seven day war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So once again, we're going to go to once again, we affirm that God has his right and his right is the right of the potter over the clay. All right. And that right makes him a creator. All right. And that gives him creative property rights. All right. And this can even help us even in understanding the law and how things operate in this world when it comes to you trying to get your ownership. The only way you can own something is if you were in the likeness of God, okay? Have full authority over even yourself. All right, so we're going to go to what is creative property rights. What is creative property rights? Creative property rights means and include the exclusive, absolute, and perpetual right, title, and interest in, in and to all copyrights contract rights, and other personal, private, civil, and property rights in respect of all intellectual, literary, artistic, dramatic, musical rights, work, and materials compromising, appearing, or used in 
or otherwise produced in connection with a program or from or upon the basis of which of which such program was in whole or in part produced including without limitation all copyrights trade names trademarks service marks musical rights contract rights intellectual rights and other personal private civil and property rights in and to all stories plays scripts scenarios themes incidents plots concepts ideas characters dialogue music words titles artwork logos and other material and work of every kind and nature compromising appearing or used in or otherwise produced in connection with each such program or from or upon the basis of which each such program was in whole or in part produced for greater certainty and notwithstanding anything else set forth in this agreement the creative property rights of sellers in a program are specifically and absolutely limited to only those creative property rights in a program granted to sellers pursuant to the applica applicable conveying rights agreement and subject in all instances to existing licenses only until expiration or termination of such existing license as applicable. All right. And that was very direct and a lot because when you're thinking of creative property right and all it entails, that's God. God owns everything. Every music, every contract, we could go through it, okay? Every personal, or every copyright, contract right, personal, whether private, civil, property, intellectual, literary, artistic, dramatic, musical, works. Yes, without limitation, all copyrights, trade names, trademarks, service marks, musical rights, contracts right, intellectual rights, other personal, private, civil, and property, stories, plays, scripts, scenarios, themes, incidents, plots, concepts, ideas, characters, dialogue, music, words, titles, artwork, logos, everything belongs to God. Anything that's happening right now, music playing, someone's everything, that's God's. That's his creative property. He has a right over all of that. That's all his because he created it. He created the words you're saying. He created everything. When you look at stuff and anybody that creates something, they'll be like, oh, you have a talent or you're gifted. <laughs> yeah. Who gives gifts and talents? Yeah. Mm -hmm. God. All right. So he has creative property right over everything. And when you understand that, you understand that with God, that stretches forth into everything. So this is how you understand that his hand is in everything because he's the creator. So every single thing is him. So when a song is played and you hear that song, God wanted that song to be made. His hand is in that song. If you're listening to it, sometimes I'm like, yo, he made this song for me. You know what I'm saying? Because who else? He got to make that person, make that person grow up to play that song because I'm not going to be a star or whatever. And I'm in that vibration right now. And that person is playing that song for me. You know what I'm saying? Because God has his hand in everything. And it's only for who? His children. So it was that thought that, yo, if I'm really God's child, I believe that things that are happening around me is for me, not like how other people are. So I see it happen with other people. When I'm watching other people, I can't really see that, okay? When you're seeing other people around or, you know, this is me growing up. But I'm like, for me, I believe something is different. I believe these things are teaching me something and leading me to something that makes me different from other people because I believe that I'm a child of God. All right, so now that goes into anything that I'm looking at. I believe God has a hand in that, touching in that. So I'm scoping that out to be like, is there something there? All right, so once again, God has complete creative property rights. And this is why everybody now wants to be like in the image of God, because you now want to have that same property rights over your stuff. <clears throat> All right, so this is why God has many people who don't own their own stuff. He has a system where they think they own their stuff and they don't own their stuff. Because creating and controlling your own stuff that is godlike power. Not everybody needs to experience that. Not everybody gets to experience that. 
but you think that you have that. So if someone's like, oh yeah, I do own this, and they're walking around, you don't own nothing. Because God set it up like that. So I guess that's why we're not supposed to own nothing? Well, Christian. you, well, he comes, well, yeah, yeah, he set it up with, under the trust. <laughs> you don't own anything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you, <laughs> you, you, you pretend like you own it, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you don't really own it. You control it, but not. All right. Mm -hmm. With that now, you have control that, okay, you, you willingly gave up your, your control over that. So that's why you feel better putting it in the trust. You're like, you know what? I willingly did that and gave that control. All right. And you still don't have control, but you have more control and, you know, say so. But it has the full control. All right. But it's not like somebody else taking full control over your stuff. But someone still has full control over you. It's just someone you agree with. <laughs> All right. So once again, owning your own stuff, owning yourself, owning your car, owning things that you belong, that's a God-given right. Not everybody is owed that right. So when you're outside, you're like, oh, this person, you need to, you know, now I'm like, yo, look at people. You don't even deserve to touch that. This is why God is making you cooperate like this. So we have to understand, because we can't bestow this on everybody. This is God's mercy he bestowed on us. All right? We got to understand the same way he bestowed this mercy. You could bestow the mercy too, but understand mercy is mercy. It has to be restricted for it to be mercy. You can't be giving mercy to everybody. Christ. All right? Through Christ, right? Yep, through Christ, yes. All right, giving mercy through Christ onto other people. All right, look. So we're going to go um, into mercy, all right, and the mercy of God. And we're going to get it expounded on in the sovereignty of God once again by Arthur W. Pink. We're in chapter one, God's sovereignty divine, defined. Sovereignty of God by Arthur W. Pink, chapter one, God's sovereignty defined. God is sovereign in the exercise of his mercy, necessarily so, for mercy is directed by the will of him that showeth mercy. Mercy is not a right to which man is entitled. All right, so once again, mercy is not a right to which man is entitled to. So once again, when you're outside and we're using this verse and the person asking for change, they're not entitled to your change, all right? This is why God made this happen outside all the time, so he could be like, hey, you're in agreement with it because look what you're doing every time you pass by, all right? This person is asking for it all the time, but you give your mercy to who you want to give it to. You give your change to who you want to give it to, not because they're asking for it, not because they're outside like that, not because you see them wretched like that, all right? So once again, mercy is not a right to which somebody is entitled to. So that means you're not entitled to anything from God. All right, because re once again, you're wretched, and the only way to get that entitlement is for mercy from God. And that is not an entitlement. We are never entitled to that. We're not entitled to Christ. You're not entitled to be a part of the community. You're not entitled to these things. God showed mercy onto you, and that got you these things. All right, continue. Mercy is that adorable attribute of God by which he pities and reveals the wretched. But under the righteous government of God, no one is wretched who does not deserve to be so. All right, so once again, all right, mercy is the adorable attribute by which God pities and relieves wretched people. All right. But under his righteous government, once again, nobody is wretched who does not deserve to be so. So God makes sure that that's how he set it up to be. All right. Which, first of all, came from Adam. So once you come out of Adam, you're wretched and you deserve to be so. And then you go do on your own and add up onto what Adam did anyways. All right. Continue. It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. <laughs> The objects of mercy, then, are those who are miserable, and all misery is the result of sin. Hence, the miserable are deserving of punishment, not mercy. To speak of deserving mercy is a contradiction of terms. All right, so once again, 
those who are miserable, all misery results of sin. All right. So people are miserable in their lives, in their ways. And some people even begin to get used to that misery and that misery becomes fun to them in regular life. All right. When they really take a good look at the inner standing of their life, they know it's misery. I got to get up. I got to do this. I got to pay this. I got to do that. And this is all the result from sin. Until we come to Christ, this is when we're realizing, oh, the Christ is showing us the new way we could live, the new way we could operate. The only way we're seeing that is because Christ is now showing the light onto us and we're heading towards his blessings, his lifestyle. All right. But before that, we're seeing how wretched our lives really are. You hear what I'm saying? It's just a lot of things is plastered over where you can't see that it's wretched. All right. Unless something's directly happened to you now where you're losing an arm, you're using the leg, you're using the eye, you got into something. This is when people are really like, oh, my life's wretched. All right. But other than that, people are now easily, you know, getting used to the misery of these world. All right. But continue. God bestows his mercies on whom he pleases and withholds them as seemeth good unto himself. A remarkable illustration of this fact is seen in the matter that God responded to the prayers of two men offered under very similar circumstances. Sentence of death was passed upon Moses for one act of disobedience, and he besought the Lord for a reprieve. Um, brackets. But, sorry, quote, but what was his desire gratified? No, he told Israel, the Lord, the Lord is wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, let it suffice thee. All right. So here we see they're showing us two cases of people. All right. Who did something to God and they both try to repent. All right. One was Moses. Look at Moses who took Israel out, did all of this. And he's like, yo, you did this to me. Sentence was death upon him. And he knew that. And he knew there was no coming back from that. All right. The second case. Now, Mark, the second case, those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amoz, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore, and it came to pass, afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, behold, I will heal thee. And on the third day of the and Salakio. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house. Alright. No, that's it there. Okay. Okay. So, Alright. So here we see that Hezekiah wept sore and he was praying unto God, asking him, telling him, Oh, remember what I did? Remember? Moses did more than him. Alright. Now once again, they both did something wrong. So they're both undeserving of mercy. Alright. But God didn't show mercy to Moses. But he showed mercy, mercy to Hezekiah. All right. Even to add to that, because when he got healed, he, uh, I guess, word got around, and the other kings they they realized that he was healed, and he invited some of the kings, including one from Babylon, and he showed them everything in his house. Mm -hmm. And after that, Isaiah came back and asked, "Who were those men?" Yeah. And he's like, he told him who it was. And he's like, "Hear the word of the Lord, because you did that. Those same men that you showed your house is gonna clean your up the house." And yo, they're gonna take everything in your house and captivity was coming and Hezekiah blessed the Lord. He said, I'll praise to the Father. 
Let his will be done. Mm-hmm. So that didn't happen in this day. That's what he said. It didn't happen in this day. You just see the evil. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. But this is the most he's just doing it because, you know, this is what he's doing. All right. This is how he operates. He's sovereign. He could do what he wants. And a sovereign person, that's the attitude that they go about. They could do what you want. You're doing what you want to do. I will have mercy on who I want to have mercy. All right. We're going to go to Daniel 14 and 1. This is the book of Daniel, chapter 14, verse 1. And King Astagis was gathered to his fathers, and Cyrus of Persia received his kingdom. And Daniel conversed with the king and was honored above all his friends. Now the Babylons had an idol called Bel, and there were spent upon him every day twelve great measures of fine flour and forty sheep and six vessels of wine. And the king worshipped it and went daily to adore it. But Daniel worshipped his own God. And the king said unto him, Why does not thou worship Bel? Who answered and said, Because I may not worship idols made with hands, but the living God who has created the heaven and the earth and has sovereignty over all flesh. All right, so this incident, King Astegis, all right, the king of Sirius and of Persia, I don't know, sorry, King Astegis, uh, yeah, King Astegis, all right, who was in Persia, all right, he's there dealing with in, in, in Babylon. This is Babylon? Yeah, this is in Babylon, all right? And they have an idol there, and Daniel is not worshiping it, all right? He tells him that he deals with the God who has sovereignty over all flesh. That's who he's dealing with, all right? Just to give you a read of this thing, at this time, these people, these kings who are in power, once again, God, who's given them knowledge to be over people, they don't even know this information. So he's dealing with an idol, all right? Daniel's here telling him, I deal with the God who has sovereignty and does whatever he wants. This king, after, it's like, yo, what do you mean? My gods don't, don't have sovereignty? They eat this food, they do all of that. So he, he really was believing that his gods was eating the food and doing all of that. And Daniel had to set it. So if you read the chapter, Daniel had to set everything up and show him that, yo, that's not what happened. Told the king what to do. They put powder on the floor. You know what I mean? The king, you know, the people was eating all the food from him. So he was thinking his God really had power and his God was really sovereign. All right. So this is why I'm telling you that the nations know and deal with God in a certain way, because they came to the realization that God is not none of these things or these idols that they're dealing with. All right. And that's what this king had to come to the realization to when Daniel told him his God has sovereignty over all things, all flesh. All right. Which his gods, his thing that he was dealing with had couldn't even eat for itself. And that's what Daniel was trying to show him. All right. And he ends up showing him and the king ends up killing those people who was making him believe that, yo, his God was living. And he, every time he fed them the food, that the food was being eaten. <laughs> all right. So one time the king worshiped the God. All right. He worshiped the God because these kings, they're doing this stuff because they don't have knowledge. This is what we have to realize. They don't have understanding. But once they get understanding, once God shows it to them, they come to the worship of God because they want to worship the real, true God. All right. So once again, we're going to go to the sovereignty of God, Arthur W. Pink, chapter one, God's sovereignty divine. And we're going to go once again to understand that God has control over everything. All right. He's not losing the battle with Satan, all right? And this is what enters a lot of people's mind, that when things is happening outside, vaccines is out, this is happening, that somehow a battle is being lost. All right, so we're gonna go into that. First of all, he can't lose because there's no evil for him. Right, there's, there's nothing to it. <laughs> sovereignty of God by Arthur W. Pink, chapter one, God's sovereignty defined. We have stated the issue badly, but there is no escaping the conclusion to argue that God is, quote, trying his best, end quote, to save all mankind. 
but that the majority of men will not let him save them is to insist that the will of the Creator is impotent and that the will of the Creator is creature. omni... Sorry, the creature is omnipotent. All right. So to argue that God is trying his best, and this is where I have to come to the realization, because, hey, most of the stuff even online that I was doing, I was operating at a time that I was trying to say to this person, get all the information now, hit this person up, make sure yo, the books is out for this person, get this person. Sometimes I go to sleep and I wake back up and this person's already following another teaching. And I'm like, damn, I can't even sleep. These people are going into other stuff. You get what I'm saying? So I was constantly, boom, I couldn't even take a week off because I'm like, yo, if I take a week off, Satan is putting false doctrine up there. Someone's going into something. But God is not losing. God is not losing a battle. This is what I had to come to the realization of to calm down my own earth. Because you will try to go out and save everybody and everything. Especially if you have that heart. All right. So once again, to argue that God is trying his best to save all mankind. And that the majority of men will not let him save them. Is to insist that once again, God is um. Potent, impotent and the creature is omnipotent they are really in control once again if it's only us and we have this doctrine no one outside listening that means god that's how he wanted to hear it am i right and we have to be settled in our heart with that not to say that we're not going to go and extend the doctrine out to people what we know when we're extending it out and no one's coming this is all because that's how god designed it to be all right continue to throw the blame as many do upon the devil does not remove the difficulty for if satan is defeating the purpose of god then satan is almighty and god is no longer the supreme being to, de to declare that the creator's original plan has been frustrated by sin is to dethrone god all right and this comes to a lot of people who are outside of the thing because they'd be like oh so so you, what about the people in that country who don't know Christianity? So you're telling me that, oh, those people are going to go to hell too? Yes, they're going to go to hell too. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Why? It's not fair. Yeah, it's not fair. It is fair. God made it that way. They can't fathom that. That's what comes, you know, it's, they cannot fathom that. And this is the questions we ask. So what about this area? What about the person in the bush over there that never learned a thing in their life and never came across a Christian Bible? And you know the people that usually want to pose and ask those questions, they don't care about God or No, they don't. Those are just they the questions they come to to deny him. <laughs> you know, those are the Wayne ones. So you mean to tell me those people over there, and if I don't believe in this religion, they're going to die? I'm not dealing with no religion that comes to you with that. Where's the compassion? Where's the love? Mm -hmm. That's why I deal with love. <laughs> <laughs> Right, and these are the people who are not beginning to understand, and as we're understanding, we're going through a lot of things that it comes to now sovereignty. Sovereignty best defines God and how He operates. And if they understand that, because now He can make He's making us come to He's making a lot of people come to this understanding by realizing what's going on outside, the laws, how they they have a straw man, a this or a that, and this is why they're reaching to this understanding. All right, to understand what sovereignty means or to be sovereign or to be all of that. All right, but once again, this is God now teaching the whole world. This is God. God is sovereign. He does what he wants as he chooses. You are not sovereign. All right, and nobody deserves that unless they're in the image of God. Um, continue. To suggest that God was taken by surprise in Eden and that he is now attempting to remedy an unforeseen calamity is to degrade the Most High to a level of a finite, erring mortal. To argue that man is a free moral agent and a determiner of his own destiny and that therefore he has the power to checkmate his maker is to strip God of the attribute of omnipotence. All right, and this is what a lot of people are doing, that man does whatever he wants. That guy is doing this on his own will, and this person is doing that. And this is even for us, we have to realize that a lot of things, how people are, how the ways, this is what the Most High made, all right? They're not doing nothing on their own accord, okay? It's the Most High that's doing these things. Nobody is doing what they want to do. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24 man's goings are of the lord how can a man then understand his own way mm -hmm. all right
right? So they can't even understand their own way. Their going is of the Lord, all right? Everything that you're doing is of Christ. Christ is doing. And if it's not to bring you to Christ, then it's going to be hard for you to read. That's going to like you. People trying to read their lives and they're outside of Christ. That's going to be hard because it's not wired to the gospel. It's going to be hard to realize what's happening with you. God's doing whatever he want to do. It's not really written to his story. With us, he has a direct... You have a play in this because you are coming to his body of Christ. He showed you his mercy. You're a part of that divine plan. There had to be a little more integral thought to how you're set up than people outside of that. Once again, in movies, if we're going to go to a movie, the people of the movie, they have certain, you know what I mean, part that's more integral than the people on the outside. People on the outside is just there. There's no real setup for them. Just sit over there and just do whatever you want. Extras. Yeah, extra people don't have no, oh, this line, that line. They're like, yo, just sit there, talk, do whatever the hell you want. Walk by. <laughs> yeah, walk by. Fill in this gap. <laughs> Fill in the gap. That's all you're doing, filling in gaps. All right, and this is kind of shown even in what we call, in what's that movie, Truman Show. All right, where everything is based around Truman. Everybody else is like filler ins, you know what I mean? But everything is for Truman. All right, once God is looking at you, everything is wired for that, these individuals. All right. So continue for us. To say that the creature has burst the hounds assigned by his creator and that God is now practically a helpless spectator before the sin and suffering entailed by Adam's fall is to repudiate the express declaration of holy writ, namely, brackets, quote, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The, re the remainder of wrath sh shalt thou restrain, and, end quote. Um, of Psalms chapter 76 verse 10. Um, in a word, to deny the sovereignty of God is to enter upon a path which, if followed to its logical terminus, is to arrive at blank atheism. All right, and a lot of people is in atheism. And the reason why they're in atheism and they don't know it is because they're not attributing the things that's happening around them that people are doing that's happening in their life that this person just did to god that means they don't believe god is in control all right they're not dealing with the god of this world and understanding that god has everything under control at certain times they're allowing somebody else to be in power and control and that's who they're placing as god and they don't they just don't really know it or really realize it because right, you're giving power onto other things that is not God. All right, I think we're going to stop there. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to Philippines 4 and 8. All right, before we do that, once again, we went through, you know, this week, so it's going to have to go into a part two. And then the, the next part, we're going to get even more in depth into the sovereignty of God. We kind of have to kind of wind up to it. All right, but we're going to be getting even more in depth on that. All right. So as we went through, we realized that God does whatever he pleases. All right. This is the main attribute of his sovereignty. All right. That God does whatever he pleases, meaning that not everything that he's doing is attached to a direct reason or a primary secondary cause. We all know everything from whence he created the world was for one first cause which was for Christ, his son. Anything other than that, sometimes it just happened to happen. It just happened as a result of the first cause. There's no secondary cause to why some things is happening if it's outside of Christ. There's always one cause. The reason why anything is happening is because he made this world to bring about Christ and his rulership. All right. What is sovereignty we went through? That sovereignty is God being the supreme authority of all things and that all things in the earth are under his control. All right, all things in the heaven and earth, he has absolute right and full authority to do or allow whatever he pleases. All right, 
And we're speaking of God the Father. God the Father is sovereign and reigns over all. He is head above all. He is even the head of Christ. All right? He reigneth over all. The only other person that has anything close to that all is Christ. All right? The only exception he doesn't have of reigning over something is he doesn't reign over God the Father. All right? Sovereignty of God consists of supremacy, kingship, and Godhead. All right? We went in to show you that Nebuchadnezzar, all right? His heart was lifted up against God, and when he was healed, he started to record down that God does as he pleases. All right? No one could say unto him why he does this, and he was a king and had many things done unto him. All right? God is the governor amongst the nations. We're going to get further into this, that the nations, their agreements, their all of that, have in it the governing of God who's governing them. All right? He's not saying nothing to them, but they know he's talking to them. And that's why they're writing down and inscripting things and doing certain things. They know how he set up the earth. They know that most people outside is wretched and undeserving. So that means you're free what? You're free bait for them. You're free food for them. If you're not with God, you're free food. They know this. Free man on the land. Yeah, free man on the land. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you are free food for him. That's why the nations are setting up, setting up government, have the people. They know that people who are not dealing with God, God has this life for you. All right. God is the blessed and only pontity. All right. And we went to show that how the Pope is parading around like he is the pontity and he's the replacer of Christ. All right. And God's going to come and show who is the only true and bless Pontitant, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right, we went in to show that the errors of today is that people are putting man, reason, these things in place of God instead of God is the reason why this thing happened. People are putting man in control of this is what's happening. That man did this or that. A lot of, and this is what people can't even find because they're going to go, this could go into many things of people, you know, be in touch, this, that, like, you know, this is to the people who can't fathom these things, all right, where it's hard for even me to explain this, because this ain't happening to me, it's happening to them, but this is what God wanted to happen, all right, for his own good pleasure, for whatever he wanted it to be in the story. All right, and people are replacing, once again, humanism and rationalism in replace of God, all right? Putting humans and man and people in power instead of God in power over history, events, and things. Once again, we went into the, the sovereign mercy of God, that everybody is wretched, everybody is undeserving, and he had to create a world where everyone's undeserving and everybody's in that position, so that once again, we use the analogy of the, the, the poor person outside asking for change that you're passing by, that Everyone's in that wretchedness when he looks outside. He's in his vehicle, his heavenly vehicle, and everyone outside is wretched in their poorness. That's what he sees. And he has to have it like that so that he could make those decisions we make when we're going to extend our change to that person. All right? So everyone's wretched, and he just looks, and he's like, you know what? Mercy on that one. Mercy on that one. You know what? Today, I'll give that one a little change. That's God's sovereign will to do so. And he put that understanding in laws of nature, in simple things like that, so we could experience what he is dealing with. All right. So on his mercy on who he has mercy on and who you want to be hard with, you be hard with. Some people outside you know, don't have nothing. You just be hard with. You didn't even give them nothing. Or you're like, oh, that person got to go do this, go to go do that. The same way God looks at things as well. All right. When we're saying God is sovereign, once again, we're affirming. And affirm means to be convinced in your mind and in your heart. With confirmation that God has the right over the pot, right over the clay as the potter. It means you know that God has the right to do to you whatever. If you wake up tomorrow with no thing, are you going to argue with him? Are you going to have it in your heart to have something against God? To be like, oh, you know, I'm going to leave your church. I'm going to do this. A lot of people do things and they're thinking they're doing things to hurt God. 
That's what they're doing. They're trying to hurt him in some way when something happened to them. All right, once again, we went into what is creative property rights. Creative property rights, all right, includes exclusive, absolute, perpetual right, title, and interest to all copyrights, contracts, things personal, private, civil. And we went through the long list of things. This lists everything in this world, music, logo, whatever it is, God has complete copyright control over all of it because he is the creator. We have music, we have arts, we have all of this, or people just fighting for their own copyright stuff and they can't get it. Why? Because once again, God has to show you that there's only one person that could have that type of authority. That person is in the likeness of God. So when someone has their like, oh, you have all your creative and thing control, that's a heavy person. Okay, not everybody has that. And God has to make it like that because there's only one person that has that. Anybody that's in the likeness of God has that type of right. I have a question. So like when um, someone keeps talking about the queen having like the artifacts from like Africa and different places, right? Mm -hmm. Because the most likely her dad took like took um I'm trying to say like, like the most that she saw with. Yes. She can afford to take those things from those countries. She can take whatever she wants. Especially from those countries where those unbelievers were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those people are nothing. To them, they know that once again, and it's us that know the hardest because we come from the Hebrew Israelites from understanding that. That's the God of the old. They didn't meet Christ yet. So they know that this is how God operates. God don't deal with you. He don't deal with nobody else. He don't. That's how he was dealing with Israel. But now he changed it to expand to more people because Christians are in all nations now. All right, but it's the same way he deals. So if you're not Christian, it's the same hardness that the Hebrew Israelites talk about. It's just extended to other people in other nations because Christians are people in different nations, all nations. But it's the same hardness. God only deals with his. He don't deal with nobody else. That's how it's always been. All right, so when he's dealing with you, he'll allow you to have these things. If somebody has their creative property control, he's probably allowing them to have that so that you can see the likeness of God. All right, he's allowing that. But the reason why we see the fight for these stuff, control over your own stuff, is because you were wretched and not in the likeness of God. So how can you have control over your own stuff, your own things? Only the king. That's because we, had, we come from a kingdom where king is the only one that had control over that. He controlled everything in that realm other than that. So nobody had that creative control except for someone who came close to God. And that's what people are realizing now. My car is not really my car. My house is not really my house. My this is not really my this. this huh? Not even your children are yours, okay? Based on the way the system is set up. Until what? We come to Christ and then we realize that and now we're trying to change that because now he's saying, okay, you're coming into my likeness now. Now you get the blessedness of God. These are things that are attributes of God. All right. And once again, and this has to happen so that he can now extend that mercy because that mercy is not an entitlement. Mercy is not something you are entitled to. You're not entitled to life in Christ. You're not entitled to salvation. You're not entitled to his blessedness. You're not entitled to a good life. You are entitled to curses, to damnations, to hell, the way he set everything up. And if you get it, it's a privilege. If you get it, it's a privilege. Be thankful. Kiss the floor. Praise God. That's what it is. And that's what he's trying to show us. Yeah. Other than that, yeah. There's no. Stop right there. mm -hmm. All right. So once again, to argue that man is a free moral agent, determiner of his own will, destiny is therefore has the power to checkmate his creator and to strip God of his omnipotence. All right. So once again, we're going to go to Philippians 4 and 8. It's the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren... Whatsoever things are true. All right, so it's true. God has full right and authority over everything. God can do whatsoever he pleases. If this building fall over right now and we fell out, he could have, that's because of his own goodwill. And we have to be okay with that. We got to be okay with that in our heart 
And this is what all creation is. Imagine the animals outside that are made a certain way. They're like, oh, God, made, they're just saying, yo, they're happy to be what, however God made them. They want to accomplish what it is God accomplished for them. If my purpose God made for me was to drop out this window right now, let's go. That's the <laughs> attitude it has to be. And God will reward that type of attitude. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about somebody that was normal and then they got into accident. Even those people too as well, they have a positive outlook on life where because something significant happened now they actually changed their outlook on life. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about those that were born that way, usually if you see interviews and whatnot with them, they're usually very positive. Mm -hmm. No, they have to be. Because now they have to look outside of their own fleshly self and humble themselves and look at life how it really is. All right, continue. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just. All right, and it's just for the Most High being the sovereign to do whatever he wants, to will whatever he wants, to do whatever he pleases. Just like how when we go to go home, take a look at how you took off your shoe, how you threw down your stuff, whatever you did, however you handle, whatever it is you handle, you do whatever you want to do with it, especially when it's of something of none importance, a little piece of plastic, a little piece of this. Watch how you handle it. That's how God has control and authority over all things. Continue. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. All right, so once again, all praises be unto the Most High, Almighty, Ahai Yeshahaya Christ, our Lord and our Savior. This is the Essien Community Church of Christ. I am Archbishop Shamar. I'm Bishop Tabak. And once again, enjoy the rest of your Sabbath day and enjoy the Lord's Day coming up tomorrow. And all praises be unto the Most High, Almighty. So be it. Let's go. So be it.